Okay, so Ghana, right. You've been looking into this basic amenities first thing Richmond Bash is pushing. Yeah, looks like a pretty big deal. Definitely seems to be catching on, at least from what you sent over. Well, I mean, everyone needs water and lights and, you know, all that stuff. Exactly. It's like the foundation, isn't it? Yeah, if you don't even have those basics, forget about all the other fancy development stuff. And that's what makes this interview, this Voice of the People, so interesting, right? He's basically saying... These things aren't privileges, they're rights. Totally, and he's making it central to his whole campaign. Which is a pretty bold move when you think about it. It is, especially given Ghana's history. Oh yeah, decades of promises, starts and stops. And a fair bit of skepticism from people who've heard it all before. Like Ama, right. Oh, absolutely, her story is powerful. His school teacher from Volta region paints a pretty stark picture. Yeah, when you hear that kids are bringing their own water to school. Because there's no running water there. It hits you how far there is to go. Yeah. And then on top of that, she mentions these frequent power outages. Totally disrupts everything. Kids can't learn. She can't teach. It's like this cascade, right? Yeah. One problem on top of another. Yeah, you start thinking, how can people even get ahead when they're dealing with this every single day? And that's where Bash comes in with this whole new Ghana pitch. Uh, promises, promises, right. We've heard that before. But he lays out this three-point plan, which, at least on the surface... Sounds somewhat different. Right. So first he's talking about investing in rural infrastructure. Which, to be fair, is where Ama's school is. These areas that get neglected. Yeah, he specifically talks about better roads, water systems, solar power for these villages. It's smart politically, too, right? Appeal to the people who feel left behind. Totally. Like he's saying, we see you, we hear you, but I mean, have we not heard the song before? Oh, there's definitely a lot of yeah, right vibes out there. Especially when you listen to Ama's questions in the interview, you can sense that doubt. Years of disappointment are hard to shake off. <laughs> so what makes Bash think he can deliver where others have failed? Well, that's the million CD question, isn't it? He keeps saying investment, but where's the money coming from? He's a little vague on the specifics. Gotta leave him wanting more, right? Classic politician, haha. -ha. But some are saying foreign investment. Others think it hinges on his second point, tackling corruption. Which, let's be honest, that's a beast in any country. It's like this hidden tax, you know, money just disappearing. Instead of going to schools and clinics and roads. Exactly. So even if he gets the funds, how do you make sure they actually reach the people who need them? And that's what Alma asks him point blank in the interview. Oh, yeah, that was a great moment. How will we know this time it's different? Gets right to the heart of it. And you can tell it kind of throws Bash off guard a little. Okay, so grand plans, lots of skepticism. And then this third point, the most interesting one, I think. Governance from the ground up. Yeah, that's the catchphrase. But what does it actually mean? He's talked about giving local leaders a real say. Teachers, healthcare workers, people like Ama. Instead of everything being decided in Accra. Right. The power flows upwards. Decisions are made closer to the people they affect. Sounds good in theory, but does that mean Ama suddenly gets to decide the school budget? Now that would be a story. Right. So the question becomes, how much power are we really talking about? Because he uses these terms like empowerment, decentralization, but what do they mean in practice? Is it just consulting with people before making the same old decisions? Or is it truly handing over control? That's where the details matter. He talks about giving these folks a seat at the table, but... A seat doesn't equal a voice, right? Okay. Do they get to actually decide anything? Or is it just for show? That's the cynicism talking again. But honestly, it's a valid concern. It is. We got to see how this plays out. Absolutely. Actions speak louder than words, especially in politics. So governance from the ground up. A nice slogan, but the devil's in the details, right? Always is. We need to see the nuts and bolts to know if this is real change or just more hot air. Yeah. And this is where looking at other countries is helpful. You know, seeing what's worked elsewhere. Like places where this whole bottom-up thing has actually made a difference. Yeah. Well, on all ears, lay it on me. Okay. So, for example, there's this thing called the Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank. It's in Bangladesh. They do these microloans, but it's all focused on women. Interesting. Yeah, empowering them at the community level, really grassroots stuff. So they're given the tools and resources to kind of lift themselves up. Exactly, and it's been incredibly successful, like way more than just giving handouts. Makes sense. Invest in people directly. Right, and then there's this other cool example, participatory budgeting. Participatory budgeting? Hmm, I haven't heard of that one. It's been happening in Brazil, some other places too. Okay, what's the deal with that? Basically, people in a neighborhood they get to decide how some of the public money gets spent. Whoa, really? Like yeah. directly decide?
Yeah, they have meetings, they vote on projects. Pretty amazing. So it's like true democracy in action, not just voting for some guy every few years. It's about having a say in the stuff that directly affects your life. I like it. And it seems to work. Projects are more likely to succeed when people have that ownership. Makes you wonder why we don't do that everywhere. Well, there are challenges. It's not always smooth sailing. It's like what? Too many cooks in the kitchen. That could be a problem. But one of the big ones is this thing called elite capture. Elite capture. Okay, that sounds ominous. Yeah, it's basically when powerful people, local bigwigs, they figure out how to game the system. So instead of the money going to where it's needed most? It ends up lining their pockets mm -hmm. or going to projects that benefit them directly. Ah, man. So even with good intentions, you can still have corruption. It's a constant battle. And this bottom-up approach can be vulnerable to that. Can you give me a concrete example of how this elite capture might play out? Sure. Imagine there's a village council. They're supposed to decide where to build a new well. Okay. Vital for the community. Right. But instead of picking the spot that benefits everyone... They put it on the chief's brother's land. Bingo. Suddenly it's not so democratic anymore. So you need safeguards, ways to make sure the power isn't abused. 100%. Transparency is key. Like what kinds of things specifically? Well, you got to have open meetings where everyone can see how decisions are being made. No more backroom deals. Exactly. And you need independent audits, make sure the money's going where it's supposed to. Checks and balances. Right. And there should be easy ways for people to report any shady stuff they see. Like a whistleblower hotline. Something like that. Accessible to everyone. So it's not enough to just give power away. You need a whole system to make sure it's used responsibly. It's a lot more complicated than just saying power to the people. And that's where Amma comes in, right? If this is going to work, people like her need to be involved. Oh, absolutely. Citizen engagement, that's the secret sauce. It can't just be a few people making decisions for everyone else. Nope. Everyone needs to be informed, engaged, ready to hold their leaders accountable. Which is tough, right? Especially when people are just trying to survive day to day. It is. There's a lot of apathy, distrust. Right. People might be tired of empty promises. Like, I'll believe it when I see it kind of attitude. And that's understandable. So you, you need to build trust, show them that their voices actually matter. Okay, so how do you do that? How do you get people fired up about participating? Well, for starters, education is huge. People need to understand how this system works. Civic education, teach them their rights, how to make their voices heard. Exactly. And it can't just be dry lectures. You got to make it engaging. Community workshops, maybe some radio programs and local languages. Yeah. Stuff that meets people where they are. Even using mobile phones, right? Yeah. Everyone's got one these days. Oh, yeah. That's a powerful tool. Send out information, updates, even reminders about meetings. It's like building a whole new culture of participation. Exactly. And that takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. But if they can pull it off? It could be transformative. Yeah. Truly a new Ghana, like Bash keeps saying. But back to Ama, you think she buys into this after all she's been through? Tough to say. She's seen a lot of disappointment, heard a lot of promises. So the question becomes, can Bash convince her, convince everyone that this time it's different? That's the real test, isn't it? Can he deliver? Can he actually make this happen? It's a gamble, for sure. Big time. But what's the alternative? More of the same. More people struggling. That's the choice, status quo or something new, even if it's risky. And that risk, that's what makes this whole thing so fascinating to watch. It, okay, so bottom-up governance, big potential, big challenges, and a whole lot riding on whether people believe it'll actually work. You got That's the story of Ghana in a nutshell. And even if Bash gets everything right, even if he wins the election and puts all these plans into action. It's not the end of the story, is it? Meaning? Development. It's not a finish line you cross. It's an ongoing thing. So even in New Ghana, we'll face new problems, new hurdles down the road. For sure. There'll be bumps in the road, unexpected challenges, new needs that pop up. So it's not just about building something new. It's about making sure it can adapt, evolve. Exactly. It's got to be flexible, resilient, able to keep up with the changing times. It was like, I don't know, tending a garden or something. Oh, I like that analogy. You plant the seeds, you nurture the soil, but the work never really ends. Right. You got to keep weeding, watering, adjusting to the weather. And you need everyone involved, right? The gardener, the people who eat the food, everyone's got a role. That's the key takeaway. Development is a team effort. So even if Bash's vision takes root, the real responsibility falls on the Ghanaian people. 
Absolutely. They got to keep tending that garden, keep working towards a better future. Because ultimately it's their country, their lives. And that's where the real power lies, the yeah. power to shape their own destiny. Okay. So we've covered a lot of ground here. Yeah. From Emma's reality to Bash's big promises. And everything in between, corruption, this whole bottom-up governance thing. A lot to unpack. So where does this leave us? What does this new Ghana actually look like if Bash actually pulls it off? Well, it's more than just, you know, shiny new buildings and fancy projects. It's a mindset shift, right? Exactly. It's about empowering people, giving them the tools to shape their own future. So let's paint a picture. Imagine Amma back in her classroom. Yeah, but this time... The kids aren't thirsty. Because there's actually running water, reliable water systems in place. The lights stay on, no more power cuts, disrupting lessons. And instead of spending hours fetching water, she's actually got time to... Collaborate with other teachers, maybe even local officials. To improve the school, make it better for everyone. That's the kind of empowerment Bash is talking about. When you take care of the basic needs. It frees up people's energy to focus on bigger things. Solve problems that have been holding them back for years. Exactly. So it's a ripple effect. But we ought to be real. Even if everything goes perfectly, there will be challenges. Oh, okay. for sure. Development is a messy process. So what are some potential pitfalls, things we haven't really talked about yet? Well, one thing that comes to mind is capacity building. Capacity building. Yeah. Like giving people the skills and knowledge to actually manage all this new stuff. Because it's one thing to hand over power. But if people don't know how to use it effectively... It could backfire, right? Totally. Could lead to even more mismanagement, more frustration. So you need training programs, right? Absolutely. For local leaders, for community members. Teach them about budgeting, project management, all that stuff. And you need systems in place, transparent ways to track the money, make sure it's being used properly. No more just handing over a sack of cash and hoping for the best. Exactly. you got to have accountability every step of the way. And we can't forget about technology, right? Oh, yeah. Ghana's got a pretty high mobile phone usage. So why not use that to our advantage? Mobile money for transparent payments, online forums for feedback and suggestions. Even apps to report problems, request services. Exactly. It's like using the tools they already have. To make development more efficient, more accessible. And that can help build trust, too. Show people that things are actually changing. Because, let's be honest, there's a lot of cynicism out there. People like Amma. They've seen a lot of broken promises. So how do you convince them? How do you get them to buy into this new Ghana? Actions speak louder than words. Right. So it's not enough to just talk about it. you got to deliver. Early wins are crucial, even small-scale projects. Like if Bash can get reliable water to a few villages. It could create this ripple effect, restore some faith in the system. It's like building a bridge brick by brick. Exactly. Showing people that things can actually change, that their voices matter. And what about the international community? What role do they play in all of this? Well, it's got to be more than just traditional aid, right? More than just throwing money at the problem. Yeah, it's about partnerships, collaboration, sharing knowledge and expertise. So imagine international organizations working with Ghanaian universities. To train local leaders, help them develop sustainable solutions. Or tech companies partnering to create platforms specifically for rural communities. Exactly. It's about fostering a global ecosystem of support. Because this new Ghana can't be built in isolation. It needs everyone working together. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's the key takeaway? Ghana's at a crossroads. It's a really exciting time. But there's no guarantee of success, yeah. right? Bash has laid out a vision, but it's up to everyone to make it a reality. The government, the people, the international community. It's a collective effort. Yep. And it's going to take time, patience, and a lot of hard work. So if you were in Amaja's shoes, what would you do? Would you sit on the sidelines, waiting to see what happens? Or would you roll up your sleeves and get involved? Because ultimately, development is not a spectator sport. It's about everyone stepping up, taking ownership, and working together to build a better future. For Ghana and for the world.